on the, the, the scripture this past Sunday where I talked about uh, Jesus having the interaction with uh, the Apostle Peter who became the Apostle Peter. And what did he say? He said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And behold, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Tonight I want to teach a tandem message on binding and loosing and, what, and how prayer and intercession facilitate that portion of binding and loosing found within your Bible. Okay? So I'm just going to dive right into that. Is that all right? Point number one for tonight. I want to give you a primer on intercession and spiritual warfare. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, this is what the scripture says. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Dear friends, flesh and blood is not our enemy. It's the, it's the spirit behind the person. Okay? Oftentimes it's difficult for us to separate the two because we equate the action of the person to the character of the person. But sometimes there's a spirit that is active and it ain't the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. So what does Paul say? He said, we don't wrestle, we, we, we do not contend, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand firm. Dear friends, the first step in understanding intercession is that you are not fighting against people. The premise of intercession, well, I just prayed that such and such be removed from office. You need to pray against the spirit behind that person that is, that is occupying that authority and not the person. Because hear me, generation after generation has died, but evil has continued to propagate. Why? Because there's a spirit that is active in the earth. So we have to understand that, first of all, that whenever we are operating in intercession, we are not fighting against a person. We are not fighting against movements. We are not fighting against institutions, and we are not fighting against organizations. Whenever we are interceding and we are active in spiritual warfare, friends, we are fighting against the spirit behind those stated entities. And as Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against entities in the spirit realm. So first and foremost, allow me to make this statement. And I need to just, I, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to hit some things tonight. And I need you to listen to me. Demons and fallen angels are not the same thing. Amen. Now, why would I bring that up? Because a part of spiritual warfare is understanding the spirit world. You cannot fight an enemy that you do not understand. According to your Bible... Demons and angels are not the same thing. Fallen angels are angelic beings that were expelled or rather fell from, their first uh, uh, fell from their first estate. That's what scripture teaches. Demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. There is nowhere in your Bible that the Sethite view of Genesis chapter 6 can be biblically accurate. Because every time in the Old Testament, whenever the word says the sons of God, the Behanet Elohim, the sons of God, that is in regards to angelic beings. It is not the, the, the sons of Seth or the righteous seed of this or that. The Bible says that angels came and had sex with the daughters of men and from them came the giants of the Old Testament. That is Genesis chapter 6, that is, biblical, that, that is biblically accurate. Angels and demons are not the same thing. The demons or demon or evil spirit is the byproduct of the giants being destroyed in Noah's flood. They are disembodied spirits. They are spirits without a soul, which is the reason why demons manifest through the bodies of people to gratify lustful desires sexual perversion and otherwise why because in genesis chapter 6 what does it say it said that evil continually grew and men did things amongst themselves that they ought not do and even the meditation of their heart and the thoughts of their mind grew more and more evil every day and it's interesting to me that every time that the apostles corrected a church in the new testament 
sexual perversion or sexual promiscuity was always listed in the sins that were active. Why? Because there is a spirit active in this earth that tries to manifest itself through physical desires to meet a need that it cannot gratify because demons do not have a celestial body the way angels do. Is everybody with me? Now again, I have spent almost two decades of my life studying this. I do not claim to be a master of this, but I will tell you that so long as I'm in the Bible, we're in the Word. So moving forward, how can I make this statement? Number one, fallen angels do not possess the bodies of humans. Any person that I have ever had to exercise a demon out of, it was not a fallen angel. Fallen angels do not need a body to manifest themselves because they already have one. Angels, whether fallen or in a righteous state, are interdimensional beings. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Moving forward from there, demons do not have celestial bodies or any body other. So they are disembodied spirits without a soul. Hence the reasons why demons seek to possess people, but fallen angels do not. Number two, angelic beings have a different abilities such as positions of authority in the earth. Demons do not have authority but rather an unquenchable desire to possess and seek to gratify their sinful desires through their hosts demonic possession and so forth. Demons are parasites. Fallen angels are authorities. There's a reason why whenever Jesus cast the demons, not fallen angels, cast the demons out of the demoniac in Gadara, what did, what did the demons say? Send us not forth thither from this place. Allow us to go into the pigs. Even demons are regional. You don't believe me, get filled with the Holy Ghost and travel around the world and go into different cities and you will sense the spirit of those cities. I'm not going to call any names, but I can go into certain cities and my spirit is disturbed because there is demonic activity there, voodoo and otherwise. You travel around the world and go into, and go into cultures and nations that practice witchcraft and warlock and all of these different things. Guys, that is real. There's a reason why the world gravitates to it. Oh, that's just hocus pocus stuff. That's just child's play stuff. Well, you allow that in your house and whenever you or somebody close to you gets filled with a the devil, then come see me. Because it's not something to play with. It's not fake. If it was fake, then why does the world flock to it? it it's powerful, but it's a false power. Because it is demonic. Now, moving forward from there. <clears throat> Point number three. We are commanded to cast out devils or exercise demons. But we are cautioned in our manner in which that we confront fallen angels. I'm going to say that again. We are commanded to cast out devils. Jesus said, behold, I give you all power in heaven and earth and below the earth. And behold, you will cast out devils, speak in new tongues. And if you drink any deadly thing, it will not kill you. Am I in the word, Brother Darnell? That's what the word says. But it also gives us caution of instruction of how we facilitate communication in dealing with fallen angels. This is what the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 says. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile their flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious one. But even when Michael the archangel was contending with the devil, he was disputing over the body of Moses. Even Michael, being in a righteous state, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment against the devil, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Well, are we supposed to be afraid? No. But, but should we know our word and how we practice spiritual warfare? Yes. Because there's, there are rules of engagement in the spirit world that your Bible identifies. Is everybody with me? Furthermore, there is obvious evil angelic activity in the earth. The apostle, spoke, the apostle Paul spoke on this very point in the book of Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. What does he say? For him, by all, excuse me, for by him all things were, were created in heaven and on earth. Shout heaven and earth. Visible and invisible. Whether it be, check it now, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, shout all. All things were created through him 
and for him. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our what? Of our warfare are not of the flesh, but what? But have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds are demonic authorities in the earth that we have a divine responsibility to wage war against. Why? Because Jesus said, not even the gates of hell shall prevail against my church. It is a duty of the church to destroy everything that is anti-kingdom. And if we think that a righteous nation becomes unrighteous because of the rise of sin, that is wrong. A righteous nation becomes unrighteous when righteous people forfeit their duty to their nation to guard it. Moving forward, everybody with me. Again, our warfare is spiritual. Shout spiritual. And it requires spiritual weapons to be wielded, not carnal ones. Not carnal ones. Number two tonight, everybody with me. Again, a primer, a primer on spiritual warfare and intercession. Fallen angels and demons are not the same thing, and there is a spirit world that is far more real than what our world is. I'm on, and we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. The bedrock of intercession is spiritual warfare. It's more than prayer. Oh, well, we're going to intercede for the nations of the world. Stop. Intercession has its bedrock in spiritual warfare. You are interceding and contending in the spirit to tear down strongholds. Is that not what Corinthians just told us? Yes. So the bedrock of intercession is not simply praying or talking to God. I'm not minimizing that. But intercession is the next level. Shout the next level. It's more than just communicating, it's waging war for and on behalf. It's spiritual warfare. Now, many of us have heard this verse in Ephesians 6.10, quoted as I read earlier, but oftentimes it's quoted in a manner that's not necessarily in context of Scripture. <clears throat> so I want to dissect this verse, and I want to show you a few things that it says. There are a few words that I want to draw your attention to. Number one, in Ephesians 6.10, whenever it says rulers and authorities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces and heavenly places, I want to show you what, what that says in the Greek of what Paul was trying. Paul was trying to make a point, and I want to draw it out of the word tonight. So number one, the Greek word for rulers used here is archos, archos, A-R-C-H-A-S. Authorities in the Greek is exousias. Cosmic powers is cosmocretoris, okay? Sp uh, spiritual forces is pneumatica. And heavenly places is eporaneus, eporaneus. Archaeus means a ruler or a magistrate, a seated person with power. A ruler or a magistrate, a seated person with power. Exousius means force or capacity, or delegated influence. Again, seated authority is one realm of the spirit in, in the demonic. The next step of that is demonic influences. Look around you. Now we have grown people who don't know what gender they are, and they're identifying as animals now. Amen. It's not mental illness. It's a spirit. It's an influence of the demonic. <clears throat> Moving forward from there. Uh, uh, exousius is force, capacity, delegated influence. Cosmocratoris means a world ruler or an epitaph of Satan. A, a ruling, governing dominance that has influence around the world. This is derived from the Greek word cosmos and kratora. Universal authority. Cosmos. Expanding, universal, cosmos, kratora, and then pneumatica means spiritual, non-carnal, ethereal, spirit, or supernatural beings. 
So whenever Paul is trying to explain to us that there is a principle of spiritual warfare against rulers and authorities and spiritual wickedness in high places, this, this is not child's play, church. He's trying to give us insight that there's an order to the, to the demonic and to the spirit world, and it's more real than what we realize. And if we do not respect it, and if we don't take authority over it, it will influence us, it will dominate us, it will destroy us if we're not careful again it's very important for us to understand that these words have meaning and I define these because I'm wanting you to understand something that each of these annotations that the Apostle Paul made are different but all in reference hear me now to spiritual positions of authority and power or influence in the demonic realm or the spirit realm. Well, I don't believe in that. You need to read your Bible. Even Jesus said, you say that I cast out devils by the help of Beelzebub, but how could I cast out demons by the power of demons lest the kingdom of Satan be divided and be destroyed? He says that Satan has a kingdom, and according to your Bible, he does. And if a kingdom divided against itself, it shall not stand, which tells me that there has to be an order of authority in the demonic realm as well as in the angelic realm. Is everybody with me tonight? Are y'all ready to go a little deeper? <clears throat> Moving forward from there, what, what these noted points are listed by, by Paul is this. I would like to suggest that could it be that Paul is giving us a hierarchical structure of what the demonic and the spirit realm looks like when it comes to fallen angels ruling as deities in the earth. Well, I don't believe in demonic fallen angels ruling as deities in the earth. I'm going to show you in your Bible because it's in both, and New Test both Old and New Testament. Everybody with me? So if it's in the Word, we're safe. Is everybody all right? Anybody challenged thus far? Just, just wave your hand at me. Shout yes. Could it be that Paul, in speaking to us, about these different positions that it's actually defining a hierarchical system within the spirit world that Paul learned about while dealing with, with demonic powers. For example, I believe it was in Galatians where Paul said, at, at, uh, I fought the beast at Ephesus. I fought the beast at Ephesus where the throne of Satan is. Well, wait a minute. He's contending against what? A fallen deity, a supernatural stronghold in the city. And notice, whenever Paul began to contend against demonic authority, people would rise up and try to kill him. Why? It wasn't about the person. It was about the spirit behind the people. Are you with me? So moving forward from there, now how can I validate this suggestion about a hierarchical structure within the demonic? Simply put, fallen angels are organized, they are territorial, and they are evil, period. Now, how can I prove that? I want you to take, for example, the prophet Daniel, whenever he has an interaction with an angel in the earth. Now, now check out what this says, Daniel 10, verse 10 through 14. And behold, a hand touched me. So notice, a physical contact. Paul, Daniel wasn't having a vision, he was having an experience because a hand physically touched him. So he was not, shout it with me, he was not having a vision, he was having an experience. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. It scared him to death. And he said to me, this angel, O oh Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. Shout sent. So the angel came from somewhere. Moving forward. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, fear not, Daniel. Notice now, from, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been what? Have been heard. And I have come because of your words. Pause. The prince of Persia, excuse me, the, the prince of of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Pause. 
He was withstood by what? By the prince of the kingdom of Persia. For how many days? 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael the archangel, comes and wages war on behalf of this angel sent as a messenger from God to Daniel with an answer. Well, wait a minute. The prayer was hindered. Exactly. Because the moment Daniel prayed, what does it say? God heard him. I was dispatched with an answer, but I was detained in a demonic realm with an answer to your prayer, but I couldn't get to you because demonic principalities were withholding me getting to you. Is that, am I in the word? But what does it say? The prince, singular, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Notice now, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. Singular prince of a kingdom of Persia. Then he is now detained by the kings of Persia. Notice, a prince is what? Under a king. So he's detained by a prince of palatine. Come on, somebody. With a word from heaven to give an answer. But then what happens? The prince of palatine withstood the angel and detained him in an interdimensional space. Michael comes and wages war on his behalf to not just deliver him from the prince of the kingdom of Persia, but also from his detainment of the kings of Persia. So it went from singular interaction to plural containment. Is that what it says? There's nowhere in your Bible, nowhere, that you can show me, because I have studied this, and if you find one, I will stand up in front of Jesus and everybody and apologize for being wrong. But I cannot find anywhere in the Bible to where a man has the power to withstand the authority of an angelic being, demonic or otherwise. So much so that you look at the time of David, David tries to number the nation of Israel and does not pay the shekel of penance of counting the nation. And God sends one angel and kills hundreds of thousands of mighty men by himself. So this interaction cannot be a physical prince of a country standing in separation between an angelic being to get to a prophet. Is everybody with me? I feel like preaching tonight. For I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days for the vision is for days yet to come. The bottom line is this, church, our warfare is against the kingdom of darkness that works through people. So keep that in mind whenever you're interceding and you're warring in the spirit. It's the spirit behind the person and not the person who is the enemy. And the spiritual realm is far more real than any of us could ever understand as temporal beings on this side of eternity. Period. Moving forward. Number three. I'm making good time. Bless his holy name. I got 25 minutes left. The Bible, now is, is everybody with me? A primer on spiritual warfare. And what was my previous point? I need to back up. The bedrock of intercession is spiritual warfare. But point number three, the Bible records different manifestations of intercession. The Bible records different manifestations of intercession. So we've got a primer on spiritual warfare. Demons and fallen angels exist. If you really want to mess with your theology, go read Ezekiel 28 and tell me how it was that Lucifer was perfect in the Garden of Eden and the Garden of God. And yet the creation of man's account in Genesis chapter 2 only includes Adam and Eve. There had to have been a pre-Adamic existence that happened before the creation of Adam. I ain't got time to teach on that tonight. I would love to teach on that. I ain't got time to, time to teach on that tonight. Number three, the Bible records different manifestations of intercession. The first example that I would like to show you tonight in the Old Testament is whenever Abraham intercedes on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
In Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 to 25, this is what the Bible says. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom. Pause. I want to point something out here. Whenever Abraham re receives these men that come in Genesis chapter 18, there's how many with them? There's three total. You've got one that speaks and the other two are silent. You remember the interaction? By this time next year, I'm going to come back and Sarah's going to be pregnant. And she laughed and the, the, and the angel rebuked her. That was not an angel. That was the Lord. If you notice how many people make it to Lot's house in the story. Why? Because one is held back by Abraham interceding for the city. So three come to Abraham's house. Two go on to Lot's house. One remains for Adam, Abraham rather, to argue with, to intercede with. Okay? So what does this say? So the men turned from there and they went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, notice now, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose that there are 50 righteous within the city, will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing. Now notice now, this is Abraham arguing for the righteous judge to judge righteously. Far be it from you to do such a thing. To put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked do. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right. So we've got Abraham interceding on behalf of a city who is full of sin and debauchery, so much so that the Bible says that whenever those two angels arrive at Lot's house, that the men of the city come forward and crowd around Lot's door and demand for Lot to bring forth the two men that just came to his house. And your Bible says, bring them forth that we may know them. That is an old English idiom for gang rape them. These men of this city, both young and old, were so sexually degraded and perverse that they see these angelic beings, these men, show up to Lot's house and their first thought is, bring them forth that we may know them. Perverseness, vileness at an unbelievable degree. And these men are seeking to do evil, but here Abraham is interceding, God give them grace. God give them grace. God give them grace. I would, I would dare to challenge us that his intercession was greater than Lot because in his argument, he never mentions Lot's name. Lord, if there be but 50, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? No, if, if there be but 50, I will not. Again, Abraham comes to the Lord. Lord, if there be but 40, would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? No, if, the, if there be but 40, I will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. The Bible says, again, Abraham comes. Again, every, again, he comes. He came to God five times and talked him down to ten people. But he never mentions Lot's name. I would dare to suggest that Abraham's, Abraham's desire for God to give mercy was greater than just his family being in that city. God give us a heart to intercede for people even at their worst. The perfect biblical example of the importance, hear me, of righteous believers interceding for their land, interceding for their people, and even those who were unrighteous. The, the second point I would like to point to tonight is Moses interceding on behalf of his people in Numbers chapter 14. Very reminiscent of Abraham's intercession with the Lord, comparatively speaking, to Moses interceding for the nation of Israel. And now, please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying. Now, it's interesting that in this opening passage, what, is Moses, what does Moses say? Let your power be great as you have promised. I can't remember book, chapter, and verse. But I know for a fact that somewhere in your Bible that it says to call me into remembrance. Y'all can Google that. But it says, the Lord says, call me into remembrance. It's you, it's, and again, it's interesting that a part of Moses interceding was reminding God of what he promised. I know you want to destroy him, but I want to remind you of what you promised. 
I know that your mercy is running short and you're tired of dealing with these people, but let me remind you of what you promised, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and the fourth generation. Verse 19, please pardon the iniquity of this people. He reminds God of his promise, and then he begins to plead for mercy. You said that you would be slow to anger and quick to, and quick to give mercy. I want to remind you of that because these people need mercy pardon please pardon the iniquity of this people notice now according to the greatness of your steadfast love just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now verse 20 then the Lord said notice it's interesting that God said nothing until man began to intercede those three men that came to Abraham had no intentions of hanging around with Abraham. Abraham got in the middle of it and said, why do you go? Why do you turn your, your face towards Sodom? Well, the cry of those cities have come up before us. And notice, I have come down to see under their iniquities. And Abraham says, excuse me for just a second. Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Why would you, why would you do, notice Abraham finds out about the problem and starts to intercede. Moses realizes that God's patience is running thin. How many of y'all got some children that your patience runs thin with sometimes? Come on somebody, you're just running thin. And then they say, Daddy, I love you, and I give you a picture. And it's like a stick man with like hair only on one side of your head, and you're like, all is forgiven, right? Grace and mercy has been restored. But what does he say here? Moses, Abraham intercedes, and then God begins to bargain for mercy. He begins to work through that process. Moses stands up and begins to intercede. And then what does it say in verse 20? Then the Lord said. Could it be that God is waiting for us to spend some time interceding for him to find someone in the earth that can trust him, that the Lord can show himself mighty on their behalf? Abraham began to intercede. Moses begins to intercede. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned, notice now, according to your word. The grace of God was tied to the intercession of Moses. Could it be that the grace of God for our family is tied to the intercession of the faithful? Moving forward, but truly as I live, and as the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs did I, that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice, they shall not see the land that I swore to their fathers, and none of those who have despised me shall see it. Notice now, intercession mitigated the judgment of God, but it also forfeited an entire generation from receiving the promise due to their rebellion. You hear me clearly, intercession may mitigate destruction, but it does not forfeit the penalty of sin. It may mitigate the judgment of God of going, Poof, and then you just turn into ashes, but that's not going to mitigate poor decisions that lead to your own destruction. The wages of sin is, there's a wage to be paid. People acting foolish in your life, acting crazy, doing stupid stuff, just let them keep going, because payday's coming right i need to keep on preaching tonight <clears throat> intercession may, may may mitigate but the penalty of sin is not point number four tonight and i'm almost done there is a tremendous need for intercession and prophetic ministry in the earth and it begins with us i'm gonna say that again there is a tremendous need for intercession and prophetic ministry in the earth and it begins with us an intercessor, you hear me, a dear, dear brother in the Lord said this yesterday, and it was like bells ringing in my ears. An intercessor is nothing more than a prophet who prays. An intercessor is nothing more than a prophet who prays. It is a prophet who is praying that intercedes, but an intercessor is nothing more than a prophet who prays. What? They speak things that are not as though they were until they are. 
an intercessor just like Abraham, just like Moses. And we're going to talk about Daniel in just a minute. And I'm going to show you all some stuff that blew my mind today. But an intercessor is nothing more than a prophet who prays. And even when we don't know what to say or what to pray, that's why we've been given the promise of the Father. That's why we have the Holy Ghost. Shout amen. That's why we have the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in Romans 8, 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought to. How many of y'all have been to that point at some point? You're just like, I, I've, I've, I've spoken every word in English, Spanish, German, Francais, every, I don't know what else to say. I'm just going, Lord, help, and I'm going to pray in tongues until I get a breakthrough. What does it say? Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for when we do not know what to pray for as we ought, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit, what? Intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I'm going to read that again. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of who? God. The Apostle Paul even instructs Timothy about intercession and prayer and for it to be a perpetual practice. You can look at this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 Timothy 2 and 1. First of all, so notice right off the bat, before I get to anything else, first of all, I urge you that supplications, that prayers, that what? That intercessions and thanksgivings be made for what? All people. All people. Thus, prayer is more than just talking to God and asking Him for help. Prayer is more than just talking to God and asking Him for help and complaining about our problems and you got to fix this. What does it say? There's time for supplication, there's a need for prayer. There's a need for intercession, but then there's also a time for thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you in advance by my faith in prayer that I am decreeing these things and I receive them. What does it say? Our faith is the substance of things what? <laughs> Hoped for, future tense, and our current evidence enough of things that we've yet to see. Could it be that some of us have had people give us prophetic words and we let them fall to the ground because they blessed our ears but we never regurgitated them out of our own mouth to set ourselves in agreement with it. Could it be even more so salvation is more than just a prayer of repentance. It is a prophetic declaration of something that is futurely hoped for and my faith in that prayer of repentance unto salvation is my evidence, my hope in the season I'm in right now that if I died in this moment, that I would be in the presence of the Master. Could it be that everything about our faith walk has a more prophetic edge to it than what we realize? Just a thought. Supplications. The word used here, supplications, is the request for supply. Lord, I receive daily my provision. How many of us only pray whenever we need it? But Jesus said what? He said, give us today our daily provisions. And give us mercy today for my trespasses. As I today choose to let go of those who have trespassed against me. I receive it. I'm not begging you for it. I'm not, I'm not, Lord, I'm just trying to make it. Oh, Jesus, I'm just trying to just stay on the road. No, it's I receive it because I'm not who I used to be. I'm a child of God. My sons never come to me and say, Daddy, can I get a, some milk out of the refrigerator? Oh, wonderful. Hi, holy Christopher, my wonderful creator. Wonderful Father, Abba of all time, lo, hearken thine ear unto me that I might go forth and lay hold of the goblet that I might partake of the cow's byproduct. <laughs> no. My son say, Daddy, I, I want some milk. 
Notice, because they have trust in knowing of what I'm able to supply, they don't beg me for something they know I'm able to perform. And if we are to have childlike faith of just going, Lord, I trust you, how much more so would we walk out things in faith if we believed that we could not fail? If we believe that the God that we served could not fail us. Belief for supplication, the request for, for supplies. Lord, I know that you will supply what? All, not some, not a little bit, not 25%. Lord, I know that you will supply all of my needs according to what? Your riches in glory that are in Christ Jesus. I know who I am. I'm not a beggar in the kingdom. I'm seated in Christ. I don't have to beg God to do nothing because I know who I am. That's not arrogance. That's what the Bible says. That we are to what? Come boldly into the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy. Boldness is not arrogance, it's assurance of who you are in your identity. It's not my boys walking up to me going, can I talk to you? Are we good? No. Before service, both my boys ran up to me, Daddy, I love you, I give you hugs. They didn't come up to me, may I please interact with you? You, you laugh, but far too many of us are that way with our Heavenly Father. Because of shame and condemnation, we feel that we're disqualified from having any form of an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father. But the Lord is saying, come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you'll give me an opportunity, I can take care of this stuff. I don't want you broke, busted, and disgusted. I need you blessed and prospered because I got things to do in the earth, and I'm looking for somebody in the earth that I can show myself mighty on their behalf. I feel like preaching tonight and I'm running out of time. Whew. Supplications and prayers and intercession, interceding on behalf of others or situations or circumstances and thanksgiving. How many of us in our prayer genuinely just take the time to thank God for the opportunity to pray? Much, much less just taking time to say, Lord, I thank you in advance that just as Daniel, that whenever Daniel prayed, you heard him. But Daniel was not redeemed, he was just called. But I'm redeemed. And if Daniel could, could be heard the moment he prayed, then I know for a fact that I'm heard every time that I lift my voice towards heaven and say, Father, heal, 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 re restore, hear my cry. I need provision. I'm asking for this, and I'm standing and believing that you can do it because if you don't, nobody else can. Thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you in advance that it's done. We don't beg God for healing. We thank him in advance it's already done. Well, pastor, I'm still sick in body. Just keep praying. Because we're going to believe that things that are not as though they were until they are. I need to, I need to wrap up tonight. Number five. Oh, I got four minutes. If there's nothing else that you've listened to tonight, I hope that you hear what I'm about to share now. Prophetic ministries connect to intercession and prayer. There is a supernatural connection of prophetic ministry and how that connects to intercession and prayer. We'll give you an example of this. In Daniel chapter 9, the Bible records this. I'm just going to read a few passages of Scripture. I'm not going to read all. The Bible says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by, dis by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face towards the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord. 
my God and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled. And turning aside from your commandments and from your rules, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, notice prophetic ministry, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all people. Notice that, that the prophetic ministry wasn't just to the mass, it was to the headship and nobody listened. But in verse 18 it says this, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear me. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we have no, excuse me, for, for we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, oh God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Remember, he honors his word above his name. But notice the constant reminder, your word, your name, your word, your name, your word, your name. What does he say? Oh, Lord, pay attention and act. Do not delay because your city and your people are called by your what? By your name. Verse 20, and while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my plea before the Lord my God from the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, whom I have, who I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice, and he made me understand, speaking with me, saying, now I want you to listen to this. This is extremely important. Look at the way that this sentence structure is written. O oh, Daniel, comma, I have now, shout now, come out to give you. Notice it doesn't say come down. I've come out to give you insight and understanding. Insight and understanding. Insight to see into a matter and cognitive understanding and wisdom. I come to give you insight and understanding. Notice 23. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, shout at the beginning, when he, when he first started. James Townsend, the moment he started, heaven activated. There was no delay. At the beginning of your pleas, a word went out. And I've come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. At this moment in history, you need to listen to me. This is, I, I, need, I, I need for you to give me five minutes of just uninterrupted attention. I need you to focus in with me on this. I've been chewing on this all afternoon. Daniel would have been a child when Jeremiah prophesied that about the captivity. Jeremiah is dead. Daniel is in a place of governance in the Babylonian Empire. He begins to read the scripture about the prophecy from Jeremiah about their expulsion and captivity to Babylon. It even went as far in Jeremiah to name the king of which would free them at the end of their 70 years. And his name was what? Cyrus. Daniel begins to read the word of prophecy about his nation being sent home back from captivity and what did it do it sprung up a well of faith in him to begin to what to begin to intercede for his nation why because a prophetic word had gone forth a prophet reads a prophecy of a dead prophet and begins to manifest prophetic intercession what reminding God of what he said I want to call to your remembrance you said through the prophet Jeremiah 70 years unto Babylonian captivity and you would bring us home forsake not your people and your city that are what called by your name
prophet is nothing more than an intercessor who prays. And Daniel, as a prophet, reads a prophecy. And it wells up faith in his inner man. And he what? He lays hold by faith to set himself in agreement. What? That what is said in heaven is manifest in the earth. My word is forever settled where? In heaven. But he's waiting for someone in the earth to come in agreement with that word to be spoken into existence. And what happens? Heaven speaks through Jeremiah. It goes on to paper. Seventy years later, Daniel's in captivity as a prophet reading those words. And what does he do? He begins to speak out loud what had been said 70 years earlier. It will be a span of 70 years and then victory shall come. And the king that shall release them shall sign by his name and send them back to their land and to their city. Could it be that the Lord has given us prophetic words from people? And they've not come to pass, not because God didn't intend for them to. They've not come to pass because we've not said them to. The Bible says that the word of God is a two-edged sword, right? That cuts every which way, turning every which way. In the Greek, it doesn't say sword, it says mouth. The word is a two-edged sword mouth. God's looking for somebody to echo what he's saying. I'll give you a perfect example. God speaks to your spirit to lay hands on somebody and he says you speak to them healed in Jesus name. What happens? When, when you speak that by the unction of the Holy Spirit, you're setting yourself in agreement for the word in heaven to invade the earth. It's prophetic and it's impactful. But it's only impactful because we're saying what we're told to say. Why do you think Jesus' ministry was so profound? What did he say, Brother Butch? He said, I say nothing lest my father has first said it. I do nothing lest I first seen my father do it. I manifest, I don't work anything until I first seen my father work that. Why? Because Jesus was mirroring the image. Whatever he saw, he was speaking. And it was happening. Why? If Jesus said, Behold, these works that you see me do, you shall do them greater. It's not that we are greater than Jesus. It's that we begin to multiply what the Father says to the Son, what the Son says to the church, and what the church speaks into the earth. And could it be that God's waiting for the church to be just like Daniel? To start to lay hold of this sacred book and say, God, everything in this book is yes and amen. And as far as it lies within me, I am willing to be a conduit of the glory of God in the earth.